I was intending to minister to you and continue on the subject that we were in at the close of last year uh, on the topic of the purpose of tests and trials. But uh, as, I as I was searching the heart of God, if I could put it this way, and I inquired of the Lord, what would he have me to share and where would I start uh, my ministry this 2024? Because this is the first message that I am ministering this year. And God has spoken to me and led me in another direction. And what I want to share with you today are the very things that have been deposited within my spirit as I sought the Lord fervently and, um, and inquire of him to give me an understanding where we are, what is it that is center stage at this point in time on his calendar, on his heart. And out of that diligent seeking of the Lord's face, I have come out of prayerful sessions with a vision, a vision for myself for 2024, as well as a vision for our spiritual family. And so I want to spell it out to you what my vision and my passionate desire is for 2024. And it is this, I long and I desire to go further in the Lord that is in my relationship with him than I have been before. My heart's cry out of this spiritual sessions of prayer and seeking God's face, a desire was birthed in my spirit to go deeper into the love of God and experience greater levels of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Now, why? For what purpose? Why do I want to go deeper into the revelation of who the Lord is, of, of experience a greater level of intimacy with the Holy Spirit? It is for greater manifestations of His wisdom, of His knowledge, a greater understanding of his purposes for us at this time so that I may be able or equipped or empowered to prepare our spiritual family for the coming of the Lord, as well as for the things that lie ahead of us. And secondly, it is to be able to reach out to the lost in a way that I have not reached out before. You know, I have been living in this community for 31 years. And to be honest with you, as I, as I began my daily routine of walking around the neighborhood for an hour or so, praying in the spirit, seeing the massive houses and the massive walls around the houses in this area, I felt ashamed that for 31 years, that I have lived in this community, I have not lifted the kind of prayer that God wants me to pray for my neighborhood, for my neighbors, for those that live in this community. And so the reason why I want to go deeper and experience a greater intimacy with the Holy Spirit is so that I can receive wisdom from God and divine strategies how to reach the lost, especially the lost that are within my sphere of influence. My heart's desire is to be able uh, to, to understand and to reach out in a way where somehow I would be able to influence uh, precious souls and bring them along into the kingdom of God. And that is my passionate desire. Now, for our spiritual family, our goal and purpose should not be any different, but to become more and more like Jesus, to love what he loves, 
to hate what he hates, to think, to speak, and to respond like Jesus in every situation. And this is, I believe, the purpose and the will of God for our lives, that is to be conformed to the image of his Son, to become more and more like Jesus every single day, and to grow in it. Now, I understand that such desires, such visions, cannot be attained through our own self-effort, but trusting and relying fully in the grace of God. For the scripture says, it is not by might, nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And then again, Paul writing to the Romans, he said, it is not of him who wills or runs, but of God who shows mercy. Just as we are saved, not by our own efforts or works, but by the grace of God through faith, even so, I believe, we will attain such heights in the Spirit, which we have not reached before, by His grace through faith. To learn to trust, to learn to rely more and more on the grace of God. So, the Word of God says that, that without Him we can do nothing. It is by His Spirit that we are able, I believe, to pray the kind of prayers that touch the heart of God and even stir heaven to act on our behalf. It is by His Spirit working within us changing our desires, our motives, our ways of thinking and doing, leading us, inspiring us, teaching, and conforming us into the image of Christ. Thank God for the precious Holy Spirit. And Paul, inspired by the Spirit, he said to the church in Philippi that it is God who works in us, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Not us, God working in us and through us, that which is pleasing in his sight. So the more we rely on him, the more he is able to do through us. The more we trust him, the more he is empowered to help us fulfill our God-given assignments. And I believe it is for this purpose that often the Lord will lead us into situations that are impossible to overcome in our own strength. And the only way out of these situations is by relying on the grace of God, relying on the person of the Holy Spirit, as well as the prayers of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. For there will come a time when you're going to need people to stand with you, stand by you, intercede for you, and help to carry you through. Especially in times when you are spiritually and emotionally exhausted as a result of the storm or the trial that you are going through. And it is for this purpose, I believe. What purpose? God teaching us to rely more and more on him rather than ourselves. It is for this purpose that God the Father will give us certain assignments that are impossible to accomplish by ourselves in our own strength, wisdom, or ability unless we rely wholly on his grace. And Paul faced more than once such situations uh, where the, the will of God led him into such circumstances that he often, he said, I've even despaired of life. Listen to one of his testimonies as he shares with the Corinthian church from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through to 11. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, without strength, 
there would be the state even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, but we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Amen. As you can see, he said, we've despaired even of life. In other words, he lost all hope that he would be able to, de to be delivered out of that situation unless God intervened. And listen, this is something that we need to learn because it doesn't come naturally. Our natural tendency is to trust in ourselves, in our ability, in our strength, in our wisdom, in our understanding, in our logic. And, and to trust God does not come naturally. It takes a lot of practice over and over again to remind ourselves that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. That we have been anointed by the Spirit and the very Spirit of the living God, the one who raised Jesus from the dead, indwells us. And we need to rely and trust him rather than our own flesh. So it doesn't come naturally. Uh, uh, to, to be able to trust the Lord, as Proverbs says, with all of our hearts and not lean unto our own understanding. And we need to learn more and more how to do this. And especially this year, because as the Lord revealed to us, we will face tough and difficult days ahead. We will have tests. We will have trials. And unless we learn to trust in the grace of God, we will not be able to overcome. We will not be able to shine as the Lord wants us to shine in this darkened world. And so we need to realize also that if we are to grow in the knowledge of God, increase the scope of our influence in Christ, to become greater blessing to the world we live in, it will come also at a greater cost. It's going to cost us something. And the cost, I believe, will involve in letting go of our reliance in the flesh and its wisdom. Letting go of the things that we have been relying on or leaning on to save us or to give us some sort of comfort, some sort of security. And um, the Lord knows what those things are. And, and that is why I believe he will lead us into situations and bring about a shaking that will, that will cause those idols, if I can call it that way, that way those, those things that we have been trusting in and relying in to be to be um, destroyed or collapsed for the sake of the kingdom as well as for the souls of those who are perishing god will always call us to go deeper with him to a place where we lose so to speak control of our lives where the flesh has no longer any say in where we go, what we do, and how we do it. We have our own way of doing things. We would like to be in control of our own lives. And that is the greatest enemy to the spirit within us. Because as long as you have control, then he cannot guide and lead you in the way that he desires. We have to let go of the steering of our lives and give him full access and control to be able to lead us deeper and deeper into the knowledge of God, into the love of God, into the wisdom of God, into the understanding of the Holy One, so that we can become more effective and more productive to the kingdom of God. 
He will call us, I believe, out of our comfort zones and into places where our feet have not been before and where our faith and intimacy with him is given opportunities to grow ever stronger. I love this song that I've discovered the other day for days now where, where the singer uh, uh, sings and says, take me deeper, call me upon the waters, let me go deeper where my feet can no longer wander where my faith will grow stronger in the presence of my Savior. And that is the cry of my heart. And I want to communicate somehow through the ministry that I'm giving you today, communicate a measure of passion, a desire that will waken your conscience, that will prick your, your inner man, that you would rise up and take hold of God in prayer like you've never done so before with a desperate cry that you would not want to be in the same place with your relationship with the Lord that you were last year and the year before. I pray that this will happen to our spiritual family, that together we will press in to the presence of God so that we may see clearer than we've ever seen before, go further than we've ever been before, experience the tangible presence of God where signs, wonders, and miracles and healings are taking place through us, through our faith. I believe that greater intimacy requires greater sacrifice and greater consecration to the things we are called to do. And you've heard this before so many times. We cannot continue to do the same thing over and over again and expect to see different results. That is foolishness. Some things need to change in me, in you, in us collectively. Some things must change if we want to see different results. Can I be honest? I'm going to be honest and vulnerable with you and share what keeps me awake many a night. And I speak the truth in Christ. My conscience bears witness. Many a night, long before daylight, I'm fully awake and burdened to pray for the state of the church. And this is my greatest concern, folks that when the Lord suddenly appears, splits the heavens and appears, many of us who profess Christ, I fear we will be unprepared to meet him. That is my greatest concern and my greatest burden. And all the signs around us, you look around you, all the signs are, you don't have to be spiritual to see this, are pointing to the imminent return of the Lord. And my concern is that the church as a whole is not ready or prepared to meet him. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we have allowed ourselves to be distracted by so many things that have brought spiritual dullness to our spiritual senses, making us unable to discern the times and the seasons we are living in right now. And when you become dull spiritually, the Lord can try to reach you, but you are, you are unable to hear, you are unable to discern, your discernment is all skewed. Jesus said, that the day of his appearing will come as a thief in the night, and if we are not watchful, we will be caught unprepared. For the last few weeks, almost every night, I wake up in the middle of the night, 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, and no matter how much I try to go back to sleep, I can't. There is an urgency in my spirit to pray and pray in the spirit, sometimes for a long, long while. 
And when I ask for revelation and understanding, what am I praying for? Because the word says that we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, for he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. When you're praying in the Spirit, your spirit is talking directly to God. Divine mysteries, the Bible says, but your understanding is unfruitful. So Paul says, what is it then? Let him who prays or speaks in a tongue, let him pray that he may interpret. So when I ask for revelation, for understanding, crying out, Lord, what am I praying for? Who am I interceding for? These are the scriptures which the Holy Spirit highlights and burdens my heart with. He leads me to the word. And listen, the spirit will always speak to you in line with the word. He will always guide you in line with the scriptures. And these are some of the scriptures, the portion of scriptures that continually come up as I pray in the spirit. And there are three portions of scripture. I'm going to ask Natasha to read uh, all three of them. Luke 21, Verse 34 to 36 first. Jesus is speaking. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with cruising drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. The second one is found in Matthew 24, verse 42 to 44. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And finally, Matthew 25 from verse 10 to 13 in the New Living Translation. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you, so you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour. As you can see, scripture after scripture, the Lord Jesus has given us ample warnings to be always in a state of readiness, to continue in prayer, to be watchful at all times for his return. Complacency, I believe, is the one single thing that puts our spirits to sleep. And not only that, it is the barrier that prevents the church from walking in the fullness of the spirit and reaching her full potential. And complacency sets in when we are satisfied with our spiritual state. We no longer hungry for the things of God, we no longer thirst for more of God in our life. We just arrived. We have parked somewhere. And as a result, when we reach that place where there is no longer any hunger or thirst for the living God, we reach a state when we stop seeking God with fervency, with passion. And prayer becomes a burden rather than a delight. And the word of God loses its reality and credibility. They're just words on a page. And not only that, natural things become far more important than spiritual things. The flesh gains ascendancy over our spirits and the voice of our physical senses 
become ever louder and louder than the voice of our spirit. It drowns, it quenches the spirit within us. That's why Paul writing to Timothy, he said, stir up the gift of God that is within you, which you have received through the laying on of hands of the presbytery. There is a time when God himself stirs us up and there is a time when we have to stir ourselves up and take hold of God and begin to cry out of him. But when complacency sets in, uh, the, the, there's a silence, there's no passion, there is no desperation. And God will hear the desperate cry. Out of these prayerful, you know, as I was receiving these words from the Lord, I recall back in the earlier days of my ministry, and I remember the Spirit brought it to remembrance that every major step of faith and obedience I took over the years in moving forward and upward in the call of God was preceded by many hours of fervent prayer, seeking the Lord's face for greater revelation and greater manifestation of his presence. Every single step of faith I took was birthed out of those prayerful sessions, out of those personal encounters with the Lord. These instructions from the Spirit, which came as a result of a desperate and a fervent cry up unto the Lord, they came and they revolutionized my way of thinking. They strengthened my faith and caused me to take steps which changed the course of my comfort in life. My life was very comfortable. I was in business. I was doing well. But there was a deep dissatisfaction within me. And I knew by the Spirit that I was called for greater things than what I was doing. And you are called for greater things than what you are involved right now. You are called to shake the community you live in by the power of the living God. You are called to influence people, even kings and princes, through the grace of God that indwells in you, through the gift that God has deposited, the treasure that you carry within you. And that treasure will never be revealed until you reach a place where you become desperate, where you cry out to God and you say to him, just like Rachel said to Jacob, give me children, he said, she said, or I die. And until that desperation filters deep down into our soul, we will never pray the prayers that will shake heaven, that will touch and stir the heart of God, and he will begin to act on your behalf. These are not selfish prayers. These are not prayers that are tainted by the flesh. Bless me, Lord, and my family and my children and my business and, and, and what I'm doing. I'm talking about prayers that go beyond yourself, beyond your family, beyond your work, beyond what you're involved with. I'm talking about the divine assignments that God has called you to do while you live here on earth. And please take note, these instructions or revelations from the Spirit, they didn't come while I was watching TV. They never came. They didn't come while I was even in church or attending Bible studies. They came during prayerful sessions of seeking the Lord's face with desperation and often with fasting. And so many of us depend on a Sunday morning to be fed, to be ministered to, to be imparted, to be encouraged, to be strengthened. But let me tell you something. If, if that is all you're receiving, you're not going to go anywhere. My message can stir you, but it will not move you. Unless you get into your prayer closet and begin a serious conversation with the Lord. 
And let me say this, there are no substitutes for personal encounters with God. I can communicate truth to you, but as Pastor Frank said once, these personal encounters cannot be communicated. You're going to have to seek God for yourself. They cannot be imparted to you. There are no substitutes for face-to-face -face encounters with the Holy Spirit. And this is my prayer. May the Lord bless us with such hunger for His presence that will enable us to give up, to let go of anything and everything that holds us back from experiencing the fullness of God's glory, the fullness of His presence, the fullness of what He has for us. May such hunger begin to ignite within our spirits. That's my prayer for you every day. Lord, ignite the fire of God within us and let it burn everything that is not of you things that you struggled with for years and you do not seem to be able to shake them off they keep coming back sinful habits attitudes uh, motives that are ungodly thoughts that keep assailing your mind and you've been trying you've been wrestling they're gonna fall off like ripe cherries off of a tree when you enter the presence of God and there you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Everything that is not of Him will die in the presence of God. The word of the Lord came to me the other day and this is what He said. Now please switch on your spiritual ears. He said, son, prepare my people for what is coming. Prepare them for greater challenges, greater trials, greater tests. For out of these will emerge a church that is strong and courageous, a church that is cleansed and sanctified and is ready to meet me in my coming. And then he said, disturb the comfort. Call them to repentance. Preach and teach the truth in love. Reprove rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Second Timothy chapter four, verses three and four. The time these scriptures are talking about is no longer coming, my brother, my sister. They already hear. Listen to the word. Uh, Natasha, go ahead. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. The time will no longer come. The time is already here. I dare say, and I'm closing with this, that the majority of so-called believers who sit in churches every Sunday no longer endure sound doctrine. They do not receive correction or rebuke. And it is my belief that if pastors follow the instructions Paul gave to Timothy, there will be a massive exodus from their churches. David said in Psalm 141 and verse 5, Let the righteous, righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness, and they let him rebuke me, it shall be as excellent oil, let my head not refuse it. Wow. That's the kind of heart that God wants us to cultivate and develop. Let the righteous strike me, Lord, it shall be a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it shall be as an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. In another passage, the psalmist said, It was good that I was afflicted, 
for then I learned the ways of the Lord. Now, as I close, I leave you with these words. Let us give the Holy Spirit the freedom to correct us, either direct or indirect when we need it. Jesus said that as many as he loves, he rebukes and he chastens. Chastening, I believe, and rebuking are evidence of God's love for his people. And this is what I believe. The day a pastor loses his courage and his ability to lovingly rebuke and correct his congregation, that's the day when he stops loving them. And I recall the days, in the early days, when, my, when God used my father-in-law. He was not a born-again believer. And there was a continual rebuke and correction, never an encouragement. And for a season, I rebelled. I fought with him until one day the Lord opened my eyes and my ears and I was able to understand not what my father-in-law was doing, but what he was doing through him. And what a glorious day it was when that revelation came and I submitted and I humbled myself before God and before him. Everything changed. I want to encourage you to get into the presence of the Lord and let him minister to you. Pray. But don't pray the kind of prayers you want to pray. Let the Spirit lead you and guide you and give you utterance to pray as you're led by the Spirit.